I'm Scott O, the Editor-in-Chief of Inc., and today we have a guest at the Inc. Vision Conference who is no stranger to the Inc. family. That's a lot of inks, I know, but then no one has received more ink from us. He's appeared in the magazine or on its cover more than any other entrepreneur. He also appears on Shark Tank. Uh, he is the founder of FUBU, the clothing line, the founder of the Shark Group, um, most recently Blueprint & Co., and my favorite shark, if I must admit, Damon John. Thank you. Thank you so much. So be careful. Don't, don't, uh, don't call me your favorite. I, I, I always say Kevin's a biter. So when he comes after you, you know. I, 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 to, to be honest, I, I, I tell you all you're my favorites. And, and that, that, that's true. There's not a lie in there. Anyway, today, today, today's uh, conversation is, is about uh, lessons from the, the tank, the shark tank, uh, but other lessons you've learned in, in your career as well. And I thought one way to do that was to talk uh, about a structure that's familiar to so many entrepreneurs, and that's sort of the traditional pitch deck or the tent poles that exist around building a business. And, and often that starts with a problem, a solution to that problem, you know, that, that idea. And, and I'm wondering when you know, when you're on that stage or in your private business you're being pitched, when you know the idea is the right one and, 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 and when it's not, is it gut or is there something more there for you? Well, you know, on the Shark Tank stage, it's a little different setup, right? You know, they're 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 creating television, so it's the typical, hi, sharks, has this ever happened to you? And it's the infomercial, right? And you said to yourself, there's got to be a better way, right? And, you know, and we don't even like to ask about the numbers initially because we want to hear the story, the background. And in, in the private sector, um, the pitches start off very simple with me. It's, I can't keep up with sales or... Um, you know, there's such a great demand for it. I don't. I don't generally like to get in too early of a stage. So, so, so reality is here's here's the best tent poles around a pitch. Um, the person tells me why they decided to come up with something because they felt that it was not being addressed in one manner or another or one segment of the market or they made it lighter, faster, and stronger. But however, when they came up with the concept and what they were doing, they ran across these speed bumps and it set them back and yet they still had the same resolve and they still had the same passion to move forward in it. But during the setbacks, what they learned that they shouldn't be doing or they should be doing or what they were lacking and they started to hack themselves at an early stage. Then they had some level of customer uh, interaction. I don't care if it's 10 million views on some place, uh, uh, sold uh, 50 units at a dollar uh, in, in 10 minutes outside of the mall. But they had some kind of proof of concept and they realized that this is who my consu- customer is. They're this age. They're this whatever. They pay 39 for this, but they won't pay 49 for this. They're looking for it to solve this problem. And then the scalability of the business. Is it investable? Is it something that you need a partner? For you, really, that there, there needs to be market traction. Someone has to bootstrap themselves enough to prove that there's traction in the marketplace for you to take a chance. And market traction could be various other things. They can say, I put out this one, you know, the Damon John, when I thought I had market traction, I did. But what was my market traction? Nobody else can get these 10 T-shirts on these uh, globally recognized rap artists, but I can, right? And that was big enough for somebody to say, wait a minute, I'm going to save 5, 10, 20, 100 million dollars in advertising if this kid could keep doing what he's doing. I just need to know some level of proof of concept. And then, um, and then, it, then, then it comes down to the person. And why do you want me in it? Is it because you think I can add value? Is it because it is just a capital uh, investment? Is it because strategic relationship? Because if you say to me, "Give me your capital," and you don't know, and I don't know anything about the business, I'll say, "Well, I can't help you with the business." No, yes, you can. Don't don't think that I can help you with every business. I cannot. If that's the case, you know, Fubu would be Nike. So uh, yeah. you know. Uh, those are all the things that I look for, and and so there. So eighty percent of it is what did you do? How did you get to this point in your life? How did you create it? And the other twenty percent is do I like you, and do I see that I can add value to you? I, I think that's an important thing, and I want to get to that again a little bit later in terms of looking at teams. Um, I, I think another uh, aspect of of entrepreneurship that often sort of uh, is a defining moment, right? It, it, is is timing? Uh, is the idea? right for the right time. And I'm actually reminded, uh, particularly now, of a uh, early, early uh, 
Shark Tank episode where a woman named Arena Block, who I don't know if that name rings a bell for you, but she um, she produced uh, masks, uh, you know, face masks that had high design on them. Um, her business went nowhere. Uh, today, that would be a very different story. Absolutely. Timing is uh, everything <clears throat> because, uh, you know, unfortunately, you, you know, when you go on Shark Tank, you don't have the liberty to say, nah, I'll see you next year. You know, you, you got to call out of 40,000 applicants and you may be at a very beginning stage or a global pandemic didn't hit or something has happened. Um, I, I'll give you, an, you know, another example of that. Uh, there was a guy on uh, first nasal defense. He had these uh, nasal blocks that block out all pathogens or a lot of pathogens. He came on season two. You know, everybody's looking for him now. Uh, you know, and even even <clears throat> the last season, I uh, I invested in a, 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 a company called Moves. It is a shoe that the bottom sole comes off the shoe, uh, you know, in case you're in my case, my wife does not allow me to go in the house with shoes on. However, the pandemic didn't happen. Boom, pandemic happens. You know what happens? Uh, all these big box companies and service companies that have installment going to homes, they want to buy all, as many moves as they can so that the men can take their the bottoms of their, well, or females, take the bottom of their shoe off and walk in your house. So it's just that less, you know, uh, troublesome. You know, that that speaks to something else, I think, that, that is probably pretty important to you. Um, and, and, and that is uh, sort of, the drive someone has, right? Because um, it, 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 the timing speaks to luck to some extent, right? You have the right idea at, at the right time. And I think m most folks don't appreciate the amount of luck that, that goes into being a successful business person. But um, if you have persistence, you tend to uh, continue on in a way that uh, that, you know, that that your persistence and luck and, and that, that timing moment with your product all, all align perfectly for you. It's the persistence, but it's also the ability to take small steps and realize that you need to do other things while you work on this dream. You know, your day job will never make you rich. It'll be your homework. Now, I started FUBU in 89. I uh, closed it down three times, so 92. Then I started working at Red Lobster at the same time and putting in 60 hours at Red Lobster and 10 hours on FUBU until after five years, it turned into 60 hours on FUBU or zero hours at Red Lobster. Now, were one of those years the best time? No, but I started to create the best timing out of it, getting it prepared with a slow run. A lot of entrepreneurs who I see fail would not have worked at Red Lobster, but I could not. I was making $30,000 a year at Lobster. So I know that's not a lot of money, but I had my medical benefits and I, I was taking the shrimp home and I was, uh, you know, using the staff on the weekends for my waiters and waitresses for flea markets. I would have had to do $2 million in revenue to walk away with that same $150,000 over five years and I would have never done that. So I just, you know, did what I had to do and then the timing was right again, you know, or right, not again, but it was the right timing because I was narrow and deep. I built out a good amount of customers who said, I like this. I was getting into the groove and I was paying my bills so I can, you know, play the long game with this. And so the, the, the idea to me, the, what I take away from that um, or what I would suggest to the folks watching us today um, is, is that um, uh, uh, saying, saying I can't do this, right, is never the answer. There's always a way forward. There's some path you can take to continue to pursue um, what's important to you. 100%. And I think that I'm going to be in this business world as long as I'm alive. And during this course of uh, where we are today, I'm taking as many digital courses as I can on uh, digital marketing, on Amazon, on pay-per-click, on uh, Facebook marketing. Why should I be doing that? I'm in a good enough position in my life where I do have people who I hire or I invest in. But you know what? If I'm going to start investing in other companies that need to have a digital marketing platform, I need to I need to know a little bit better on what is the cost of customer acquisition these days and what is this person, you know, what widget or whatever the case is so that I make a better, more informed decision that then increases my probability of success. And so I don't think anybody should ever stop learning in any other aspect of your life, whether it's nutrition or it's your faith or it's your love with your, you know, or education or whatever the case is. I don't think you should stop learning. That's what true entrepreneurs do. They learn slowly and they're in for the long haul and they never stop learning.
That, that's a terrific piece of advice, and I, I do think a lot of people would be surprised to to hear uh, you, you say that. So, so just real quickly, what are what are um, the things that you, for you personally, are important to learn about now? So, di- digital marketing is is one of those things. A couple of others. You know, my buddy Ryan Dice sent me over his course. I was like, eh, whatever. I'll look at it. It was a 28-hour course. I looked at it for one hour. I became the smartest person in the room after one hour. You know, I'm one of those guys. I learned something. And, you know, you could have read five books, but God forbid I read three. I read one book. I'm going to talk to you about the damn one book I read all day long. But, uh, you know, but but I realized this, this world is changing. And, uh, you know, we need to be able to understand really social media conversion. And I, I, I value the fact that today I can talk to my customer. I know who they are and I can upsell them or sell them more frequently or acquire new ones. Unlike when I started out with FUBU when I made a shirt, you bought it. I had no idea who you were, where'd you go. I had to find you, you know, the next week at your home to try to get you to buy a new one. So these are the things that I'm learning and that's why I'm learning because I believe that the world is moving very, very much like, uh, you know, one-on-one with all consumers. You know, when, when I don't know about your age, but when I grew up, there was only four different uh, television stations. There was ABC, my favorite, NBC, CBS, and Public Access. Now there's Lifetime. There's, chil- there's one for dogs. There's one for children. I mean, there's 10,000 of them, and I think that's the same exact way that marketing and uh, distribution is going to go towards the customer. And if I recall correctly, that's one of the reasons you were so interested in, in, in the guys at, at at Bombas, right? Because they had a different approach to marketing um, and, and connecting with the customer that was new for you. Well, you know, I think that, um, and I wish I could sit up here and say that I, I, I'm, I, I know everything that I, and I'm so laser focused. I think, I think I was the prey and they were the predators when, uh, you know, they came onto the tank and they knew what they were doing. They studied all the targets and everything that got the sharks excited or not. They realized that I have 10 fashion brands and eight of them were dead because I was not selling direct to consumer. And they realized that I have a strong passion for charitable organizations and helping our next fellow man, woman or dog. Right. And I think that they knew that they can educate me and say and so they 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 tapped into my greed, my greed to want to know how they were operating this business and how they were giving back at the same time. And they they uh, they wagged the dog, and I'm <laughs> I'm glad for it because it is the number one um, product ever invested in Shark Tank history. So not only did I get bragging rights over those other five underachievers that I you know bless them with my presence when I sit on the stage, but I also learned how to give to people at the same time while uh, you know selling them a very uh, uh, amazing product, and I also learned that the kids and the people today, they don't want to know what you did for them. For them, They want to know what you did for others. And whether you have to advertise or not, they are sitting around on Zoom or at the kitchen table going, I gave 20 times this year because every time I bought this, I helped clean up the ocean or every time I bought this, I helped, I helped homeless. And they are your biggest ambassadors. And I learned all that from my Bombas guys. It's interesting to think that the shark can, 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 that the shark can get bit once in a while. I like that. Um, you know, I think of them as, as providing, uh, you know, a unique value proposition, another thing that's important in, in, in often when people are pitching. And they did that in multiple ways, as you're, as you're saying. The product was quite different. The process through which they were selling was different. And they were an interesting team, too. So um, it, it, it's interesting to think about uh, – diversifying your uniqueness can make you so strong. And it was what you saw um, in, in them. Um, the team aspect, though, of, of, of business, starting a business, we talk about entrepreneurship being lonely, and it often is. It's often a single founder. Um, oftentimes, though, there, there are teams. I was a co-founder in a business um, that I had to leave. And, uh, it, you know, it had great potential success, I think. It was in the, the wellness space, uh, something that would be really important right now. But uh, my co-founder and I were in a bad marriage. How do you assess teams when, when you see them? How do you know that these uh, folks can and work together or, or, or not? And, and, you know, does a red flag go up for you? Yeah, you know, um, sourcing of people is always going to be the biggest challenge in your company and organization. And even if you are a 
you know the you know uh, you know the numbers better than I do but I think out of the 30 million small businesses 21 or 22 million of them are uh, one man and one woman mom and pop shops um, but whether you are sourcing them internally or you're sourcing them externally you can be a barber and you want to rent a chair somewhere you know you, you have to be part of a team right um, I find that the way that I have structured teams and it's worked out for me is that I don't jump di uh, directly into the relationship and 80% of my staff has started off in some form of an internship or a third party that took a massive reduction for three months to say I'm going to figure out my 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 worth here somebody who may have been a ceo someplace and they were making this and they said i'll come over for this for three months and i'm going to figure out my work here my worth here and you know worst scenario what happens you're out of a couple of dollars worst scenario i'm out of three months you know and we both split the baby in the middle right um and a lot of our interns and what i figured what i what i what i what i've what decided is that it's a dating process with anybody my first partner my and the, currently my still partner my my first partners, who are currently still my partners, there was always supposed to be five of us on the FUBU team, me, Keith, Carl, Jay, and somebody else. That's why there's a big five on all our product. That fifth member, we went through a dozen of those fifth members. They never stuck around. But I didn't just give away shares and or responsibilities. I said, you know, here is, you know, your deliverables. You're going to work one or two hours a week on this. And after six months, we'll revisit it. And, you know, you start to... You get people who are going to leave. You get people who are going to stay. Um, and also, when people make mistakes in my company or around me, um, I think my job is to um, manage the expectations and not let them make big mistakes. Let them make them small. Let them make them fast. And let's figure out what we learned from it, why we should have done it, why we shouldn't have, and where we're going to go next. Instead of saying, let me start a new relationship because this person made a mistake, and let me start thinking about somebody else to replace this person. Uh, because... You bring somebody else on, you have the same potential for the same amount of mistakes to happen if you're still, you know, leading the same way. So, uh, you know, the, sh the short answer is, you know, take it slow with your partners, anybody, third party vendor, uh, t attorney, whatever the case is, and slowly get into it and develop a, a, a relationship of trust and communication. It, it's sort of when the alchemy happens really for a business, doesn't it? When, when those teams gel. Um, what about... To me, uh, one of the most significant aspects is competition, right? When you started FUBU, there were a lot of other folks making a lot of other clothes, but that didn't matter to you. Um, you had a particular vision. Uh, as an investor, as someone, uh, as a shark, um, do, do, you, do you ever consider the competition, or is it just what you're being pitched right now and thinking that if it's good enough, the story's good enough, the team is good enough, the competition doesn't matter? It's a balance of both. I do consider the competition. I do consider, you know, where, how you try to build a moat around uh, the, you know, what you have. Now, <clears throat> if you're depending on purely your patents and various other things, um, and you say, well, I locked in all these patents, everything else. Well, I have 100 patents that I, I, I have not been able to successfully defend about 95% of them. So it's all to me about speed to market knowing your customer, having a vision of where you're going. I, I know you will uh, have setbacks and be altered, but it's really about speed to market and not trying to build the perfect machine and build Rome. It's about getting out there. You know, um, so so that's what I really look at. Uh, I know there's going to be competition. Cause, you know, I mean, you said it. Listen, I, I made T-shirts. I didn't put three sleeves on a T-shirt. I just had a unique selling proposition, and I love my customers to death. Uh, you know, um, so – that's how I look at it. You know, it's really speed to market. It's really, do you have a, a customer who's super passionate about what you're doing and are you super passionate about it as well? I mean, do you ever see competition as confirmation that uh, there's a market here? You know, it all depends. And you're right. Um, and, and that's a really good question. In some senses, I do. But some senses, the reason why there's competition, because you decided, hey, you got a product, me too. So I don't, I don't care about that, right? But I do know that, you know, listen, FUBU over his course, probably, as, as we all shared, sold about $6 billion worth of, uh, you know, worldwide retail sales. And I think the counterfeit has sold about $30 billion, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way it is. You couldn't spend good money after the bad money, right? Because it was coming from everywhere, the counterfeit. Somebody was stamping blank T-shirts, somebody was making T-shirts. Um, 
So I know competition is going to be out. Yes, of course, people are going to emulate you if you're amazing. Bombas has a lot of competition. There's a lot of people out there trying to emulate Bombas socks. And it wasn't like uh, prior to Bombas, there wasn't a stance or, uh, or, other, or other, other socks. But they're doing quite well. Again, uh, unique proposition, laser focus, speed to market. And there's a story there too, right? With, with with Bombas in particular, you had a story with Fubu. How important is 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 the story to the success of a business? I think today, with um, you know, social media and content out there, people want to investigate the story. They want to know where you're coming from, what what was the passion, and they want to share a story. I, I do I do agree on that. I mean, obviously, you know, if I'm I'm looking to buy a tripod right now. I don't need to know the story on the tripod. But if Steven Spielberg decided to create a branded uh, amount of stuff for the home office, I think I'm going to call him after this one to maybe I'll pitch him that one. But um, I think if he wanted to create a branded office of tripods and ring lights and everything else, it's the Spielbergs. Of course, it's great. Kind of like Dr. Dre with uh, headphones. But uh, yeah, you know, if you can tell a story, it's great. You don't always have to tell a story, though, but it definitely adds a plus if you can find some value. In it. I've heard you say that um, you're more interested in, in businesses that, and, and you, you refer to it a little bit earlier in our conversation today, um, businesses that need to scale, not businesses that need to move into new markets. Um, why is that? Well, because, you know, um, I, I know the numbers, how hard it is to acquire new customers as it is uh, against, you know, like I said earlier, of selling a current one or making one buy more frequently. You know, I want I want to be able to supersize somebody's fries. You already have them as somebody who is a, an ambassador and an investor in you. And before you go out and try to acquire new businesses, why don't you just take why don't you just take care of the customer complaints that you have here because you already have somebody invested in your product and all you all they're raising their hand saying, I need a little more love for some reason or another. You can turn them into an ambassador. Um, and I really got that from being around the super wealthy, you know, when they were, you know, people that I know that, are, you know, and you may, you know, you know, a lot of them. I've noticed that, you know, when I'm around them, they always trying to find out how can they maximize their current businesses before having to do another one. Listen, I made two billion dollars this year. Now I can either pay, you know, 500 million in taxes or a billion in taxes, or I can increase this business, pay a little bit less in taxes legally. Uh, donate to a lot of charitable organizations and not have to worry about a new staff, a new acquisition, a new this, a new that to maybe make some more money. You know, always, always take care of the home you're in right now. Uh, great advice. I, 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 I don't know many of those people, actually, <laughs> but um, I know what you mean, um, certainly. Um, I, I think uh, I'd like to talk a little bit now about, um, uh, you know, uh, Failure. You, you're, you've you've mentioned you know that you had to shelve F Fubu a, a couple of times. You've made investments on, on on the show that haven't succeeded. I'm sure that's been true in 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 private business across all of that time. Um, do you see any commonalities in 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 the failures you've had as a business person? Yes. So the. <clears throat> <clears throat> the failures I had initially in life were the lack of financial intelligence, um, not knowing how money works, which I think many entrepreneurs go into business and they have a passion and they don't necessarily educate themselves on how money works, which is not their fault. You know, I'm a firm believer that our educational system is broken and that they should be teaching us financial uh, intelligence the same way they teach us shop in school. You know, you and I, Scott, I'm not sure if you're going to want to build a birdhouse today or need to build a birdhouse, but you're probably going to need to balance a checking account and or understand how interest compounds or whatever the case may be. So so I don't want any entrepreneur now listening to this saying, feeling and kicking themselves like, because they don't have financial intelligence to say that, that they're 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 less than anybody else. So I think that's one of the things and why I have failed in the past. And once I started to have financial intelligence, I started to get that uh, landmine out of the way as I moved forward in investments. The other things that I failed at was, uh, you know, I threw money at it because I was fortunate enough at that point to have a good amount of resources. And I just bought clothing lines or bought this and bought that. And I didn't get to peel back the layers of the business to either have a passion about it and understand it with my, you know, uh, roll up my sleeves or find a good strategic partner that really understood it. So if you 
wanted to pitch me a brand and you and I and I said, well, now I'm Damon John. I have money. Let me just throw money at you. But you never really figured out the business and figured out the customer. Well, then I was giving you my money as tuition because I didn't know I didn't know your customer. and You didn't know your customer and just throwing money at it. Right. So I think that goes back to you and I when we were just talking about how it needs to be figured out to some extent. So when I'm ready to invest and those those were the biggest ones. And the last but not least is going to be an ego one. You know, when I jumped into it because I'm Damon John, I obviously can help because you stamp my name on it or whatever. It's it's going to work. No, Damon John has to get up and get his ass to work just like everybody else. Um, And if I keep doing that, I'm going to eat away at the things that are successful for me. So it's not necessarily all the ones that I say no to that uh, take up my time. It's the ones that I say yes to. So I have to say no more than I say yes. So all of these problems, though, you know, are solvable, right? Uh, I mean, you're suggesting that you you gave yourself financial literacy or you learned financial literacy. Other people can do that. Other people can come to understand it's more about the product or the market or the consumer than just spending more money on something. Um, and the ego piece, of course, um, it might be the hardest one to crack for some people, but, but is possible too. So so ultimately, um, the sort of there, there are a lot of lessons in that the, those failures. Absolutely. And it just takes you time to reevaluate, reflect, Take, a, you know, take in real criticism from hopefully you have some mentors of people you trust and people you respect and look in the mirror and ask yourself, why did I do it? Why did I fail? Why am I still doing this? Why do I have a passion to do this? Why didn't I do this? And, you know, you're the only one who's going to have the, you know, the playbook or the blueprint to your, you know, or the operation manual to your, uh, your drive and why you do things. So, I, I wish I could tell you I was much younger when I did this, but you know, at fifty something years old, I'm 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 still reevaluating things that I'm doing, and 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 I love doing that. Uh, but you got to be honest with yourself as an entrepreneur. I think that's a terrific lesson. The idea um, that uh, with all of your success, um, despite your uh, age, uh, which doesn't seem so 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 old, um, you're 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 still making the opportunity to learn and you're still recognizing things from your uh, mistakes and you're using those to achieve uh, success. And, and sort of that's one of my uh, final uh, questions for you. One or two final questions that I have for you is that what, what as you look back across the um, 25 or 30 years of your business career, what, what, what are the, the, commonalities and the successes you've had or the commonalities and the successes businesses you've invested in have had? I reflect now and I I think that, and it was really a friend of mine who made me, you know, who brought this to my light. He said, you know, you generally care about people and you want people to win. And I was like, he was like, I was like, I do, but you know, don't call me Mother Teresa over here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to make some money. He said, no, you came on a brand called Forest Bias. It was about a culture making for a culture, and you could have named it Damon John. I mean, people name theirs all the time: Tommy Hilfiger, Carl and I, whatever the case is. Then you started, uh, you know, you started writing books, and the books were display of power, or what, you know, or how, how, you know, how you can make it in all your books. And then you get on a Shark Tank, and you start investing in people, and then you use your stage to motivate people. And um, I then realized, I think it was because maybe I was an only child or something of that nature, but I loved empowering people. And I would bring a child home to my house every day and ask my mother, can we adopt him or her? And my mother would say no. So I wanted to be around people often and I wanted to empower people. And I think maybe because other people empowered me. So I, I think that those are the things that have gotten me the most excited. Now, when I look deep into a business that I have had success in, I noticed there was three key components. Um, I loved it. I love the business. I love the concept. I love what it was doing for people. I did I did my homework as thorough as I can. And if I didn't was in, was not able to operate it, I found a strategic partner that was a great partner. And I rewarded that person or they rewarded me. But then if I really reflect on it and not trying to sound warm and uh, you know, warm and fuzzy, but if I didn't truly love it. Then I did not spend time doing my homework on it. I spent a little bit of time. I thought I got the data that I needed. And if I didn't do my time spent uh, on homework and I didn't understand what was going on, then how can I understand who was the best strategic partner and or person to add value on it if I didn't do research all because I didn't have a passion or love about it? And that 
I do I don't invest in those uh, you know people that I don't have a strong love and passion and drive for because I always say I can send my money over to Apple and uh, you know they don't they don't they don't dust off Steve Jobs and he calls me with a problem right I I just know how I I'm investing in other brilliant people so I have to love it I have to love the people that I'm working with I have to feel like we're making change and I have to feel like it's Christmas every day when we find out some new way to operate it or new angle or new new this and that and 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 that's what drives me uh, relationships really important yeah um, yeah. This is uh, the Inc. Vision Conference, and when we last spoke, um, it was earlier uh, this spring, it was really at the the height of COVID. There were a lot of uh, BLM protests happening at the time, Um, and and I asked you uh, about how, what you thought about when you woke up, how optimistic you were, and you surprised me by saying you were quite optimistic, um, and, and, and somewhat because you you didn't have a choice, right? Um, or, or you did, but what was the point of, of, of not uh, thinking about a better future? As we come to the end of 2020 and we look forward to 2021, um, uh, for so many people here watching us today, you know, 2020, even if they've made money, has been a really tough year. For many people, it's been an incredibly tough year. What do you see um, in the next year, knowing all you know, the, the the decades of business experience you've had, clearly someone who has um, a lot of self-examination and considers issues. As you look ahead, where, where what do you see um, as uh, our opportunity? Where's the opportunity for entrepreneurs? What should we be optimistic about in particular? I think that... Um First of all, as entrepreneurs, we we should be optimistic that with the civil unrest, you know, there's a lot of large companies and decision makers who want to create true change. And whether it is FedEx and Pepsi saying, if you don't change the name of this team, I'm not going to sponsor you anymore. And that sends a echoing, uh, you know, voice over to everybody and say, you know what, it is some what corporate America uh, responsibility to take a stand for something or um, whether it's others who are initiating um, true change, and not just for people of color, for LGBTQ, for females, for veterans, and they're 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 having difficult discussions within their organizations, and people are starting to really understand and have empathy. And when these uh, when when the entire corporation or organization is on one page, then whatever strategies they come up with to implement will. Uh, Go for a long periods of time and hopefully create substantial change. Uh, on the other side of this, I think that <clears throat> people are pivoting. You're having you 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 are getting amazing talent that now either have reclaimed four hours a day round trip of working, or they don't even have a job anymore, and they're going to be people that you can uh, work with, collaborate with, and you're going to see massive amount of new technology, new ways to deliver value to people. And you're not going to be stuck thinking about you have to be just in a retail or you have to be here. And I think the speed of business is going to move extremely, extremely quickly. Um, and those are the ones that, you know, that's what I see as, as what's going to happen. Uh, do I see that there is going to be a, a huge uh, wealth gap? Yeah. Do I see that uh, that's going to be problematic? Yes. And uh, I, it's a little bit above my pay grade to answer how those are going to be resolved. And I hope that they do. But the bottom line is, again, like I said before, we're optimistic and whether it is because of uh, us all getting out of this um, this very challenging time in regards to our health or all of us dealing with the civil unrest, none of this is going to happen unless all of us have all gotten together. And as I wear this shirt, you know, it's, it's only it's only whether it's civil war or whether apartheid, it's always been, uh, you know, these things have been addressed and overthrown due to people of all colors understanding we have more in common than we do. Uh, against each other. And and that's why I'm optimistic about it. Damon John, I'm going to say it again, based just on our conversation today, if nothing else, you are my favorite shark. Thanks so much for being with us at the Inc. Vision Conference. And thank you so much. It's such an honor. I appreciate it. Thank you for everything.